Hello, Adam. This is your central monitor. Sorry to bother you on your walk, but I need to let you know that your vital signs are outside normal parameters. You are showing signs of ST elevation, tachycardia and high blood pressure. I suggest you slow your walk until I can do a full analysis of your cardiac health. I will be sending your vital signs to your doctor in just a moment. Please stay on the line. There are significant societal disruptions throughout history, and particularly in communication. Um, the invention of writing really allowed for the creation of what we now think of as organized society in terms of the empires of the past because then you could actually govern at a distance. You could communicate at a distance. Uh, the printing press, the telephone, telegraph, broadcast media, all of that stuff was extremely important and each one in its own way created a revolution in society. I think we are in the midst of or on the verge of one beginning with the communications that we're experiencing in the internet and now with the ability for machines to become smart and learn um, that we're on the cusp of another amazing transformation. This is a perfect futures topic because nobody knows what's going to happen. The brain is what makes us everything that we are. You know, without it, we're, we're really nothing. So everything that we do, everything that we think, uh, and everything that we remember is all based on, it's done by our brain. Um, so, you know, people might think the brain is just your intellect, but your brain is everything. Your brain is what allows you to catch a ball, or dig a hole, or watch TV, uh, as well as do science, or write a novel, or, you know, gaze at the stars, all these things happen from our brain. The human brain consists of about 100 billion neurons, and each of those neurons makes about 10,000 uh, 10, connections. And so there's a, a vast amount of complexity there, and we're really only scratching the surface in understanding how it works. So a lot of um, older research focused on the things that we find hard, so reasoning and logical thinking and so on. But now, we are, I think we understand better that a lot of the computational complexity of the brain is actually required just to solve very simple tasks, which sound simple but turn out not to be simple. So for instance, just understanding a visual scene. So about a third of your cortex is devoted to processing visual information, and yet you have no conscious awareness of what you're doing, it just happens. One of the things that makes it so complex is that it's complex on so many levels. You know, if you look at a single neuron, a single neuron is, is an amazingly complex little basically nano machine doing incredible things. And then you have small networks of neurons connected together. Uh, and then you have large systems in the brain where billions of neurons are connected through massive um, neural pathways. And then you get the brain overall. And then you get the body that the brain interacts with. And then you get the environment and the social world. So all these levels, um, we have so much to discover about the brain and we know so little. And they all interact in ways that we can't even yet fathom. And we have a small understanding of what the single cells are doing. Right? You think maybe we understand really well what the cells do, but in fact we don't all right, at the single cell level. And of course, there's billions of these cells and they're connected in networks, all right? And there's billions and billions of connections in your brain. Now, we have a better understanding of single connections, how they operate, but we really don't understand together as a 
as a network how all this operates. So nervous systems are, both in humans and in, in, in other animals, have been, the basic uh, structure of the nervous system has been conserved for a very long time, perhaps 500 million years. And so neurons communicate by sending um, spikes of electrical activity to each other. And these neurons are organized into um, groups and also into uh, regions of the brain. And different regions of the brain are specialized for different kinds of tasks. But they all have to work together seamlessly. We've certainly discovered a lot in the last few decades. There's been uh, a lot of new developments in technology which have helped us understand, particularly at a cellular level, how the brain works. I think one of the um, really big questions is how the brain is working at a more systems level. So how networks of neurons interact and how the activity of those neurons lead to our thoughts and our behavior. And that's really one of the frontiers of neuroscience at the moment. So we're using uh, zebrafish as a model system to understand how patterns of neural activity develop in early life. And the great thing about the zebrafish is that young zebrafish is transparent and we can insert a gene which means that neurons glow when they're, when they're active. So we can convert the electrical activity of neurons into an optical signal that we can record under a microscope. So we take a young fish, when I say young, I mean just a few days since it was a single cell. We embed it in a gel under a microscope, and then we can image the activity of every neuron in the brain as it uh, sits there thinking it's fishy towards. So what we want to do is uh, two things. Firstly, understand how normal brain development occurs. So understand how a nervous system becomes wired up during development, how patterns of activity emerge which appropriately represent and process information. So I think that, I mean, that's important for understanding um, obviously our biology. It's also important for uh, developing new forms of artificial intelligence. So all artificial intelligence at the moment, um, the hardware is designed by, by, by humans and put together by, um, you know, by humans. But in the long term, one can imagine an artificial intelligence that, that grows itself more organically, perhaps inspired by the kinds of um, things we're discovering about how real nervous systems are built. We could also try and fuse the, um, the depth image that's coming, the point cloud from the, the depth image as well. Like help the, um, the brain is an amazing device. It's the most complex thing we know in the universe and it's had millions of years to perfect what it's doing. And so it's only natural that we look to the brain uh, as an inspiration for the robots and the artificial intelligence systems that we develop. Copying the brain sounds great in theory, but doing it in practice is much more difficult than I think we all hoped it would be. Uh, there's a few problems. First of all, we need to know what's actually happening in the brain. And cracking open the lid and looking inside and observing what's happening with all of the neurons and cells in our brain uh, is quite challenging and we have to use a lot of guesswork to fill in all the gaps about the things we don't know. Once we've got an idea of what happens in the brain, we then have to actually reconstruct it uh, in software, for example, and that is also challenging. So we have to do things like create artificial neural networks in software that run on a computer or in the cloud. Uh, and there's a lot of engineering and tinkering that's needed to get those things to work as well. An artificial neural network is very simple at its core. It's a representation in software of what we think goes on in the brain. It consists of artificial neurons or units or cells, depending on what you'd like to call them, uh, and they represent, abstractly at least, the neurons that occur in the brain. But it's not enough to just have neurons in this model, they need to be connected together. So the second key component is connecting together these neurons in the artificial neural network, and that's where the real magic of artificial intelligence occurs. The brain is very different from a computer, um, the way it's structured. A computer basically has, the CPU is separate from the memory, and connecting the CPU with the memory, you have this thing called the bus, the memory bus. And the memory bus is working full time, continuously when the computer is turned on. And it's actually a bottleneck. So the CPU can be very powerful and the memory can be huge, but you're limited as to how much information you can transfer between the two. And that 
is a very limiting factor in the overall power of a standard computer. The brain, on the other hand, is, works massively in a massively parallel fashion. Every single neuron is doing the best it can all the time. Even the, the current best AI that we have uh, is still very, very different to the brain. It's, it's, you, you might say it's brain inspired, but it's not copying the brain. In the brain, there's massive amounts of feedback connections. So obviously we, we process sensory input and that comes up into higher brain regions um, and gets further processed and abstracted from, from the original input that we see. But there's also massive amounts of feedback coming from those higher regions back to the perceptual areas. And this feedback directs where we look and um, it gives us expectations of what we might see. And when those expectations are violated, when something unusual happens, you know, we, we attend that, we are forced to attend that. We pay attention to it. So a typical neural network will have a stereotypical structure. You'll feed some sort of input into the network. Now that could be imagery, it could be videos, it could be the sound of your voice. And then that data will go through many layers of neurons within the neural network, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of these layers, uh, go through all the connections between those layers. Those connections will gradually get changed over time and that's the training or learning process for the network. And at the end, you'll spit out something like a classification where the network tells you what it thinks it's hearing or what it thinks it's looking at. Scientists and engineers have invented a whole myriad of ways to train these neural networks, but the basic premise it typically revolves around feedback. So you feed some sort of data into the network and you look at what the network, for example, classifies it as. Now the network at the beginning won't be very good at doing it. It might get it wrong. So you then give it some feedback about what it got wrong, how badly it got it wrong, and then the network will subtly alter the connections within it until it does the thing correctly. Both the human brain and the brains of other animals are very good at solving these tasks like processing sensory information, for instance, visual information. And that has been a great inspiration to artificial intelligence in terms of the kinds of problems it's trying to solve. So in the early days of artificial intelligence, there was a focus on reasoning problems, which feel like hard work to humans. But now people have become more interested in trying to build that higher level intelligence from this, what you might call lower level in intelligence, which is still extremely complicated. And one of the big inspirations for recent developments in sort of neural network versions of artificial intelligence is the hierarchical structure of the brain. So, for instance, to process visual information, there are several layers of cells in your retina and they send connections to um, more centrally in the brain. And then there's several stages of, of processing which is arranged fairly hierarchically. And so the most popular kinds of neural networks these days are arranged in this hierarchical form. So each layer of artificial neurons, both artificial and real neurons, each layer extracts more complicated properties from the input. And that turns out to be a very good way to decompose these kinds of computational problems. There's been two major breakthroughs in the, in the last few years. Um, those are deep learning and reinforcement learning. And both of those were inspired by biology. So in deep learning, uh, that refers to networks which consist of many layers of artificial neurons. So information f flows through those many layers. Each of those layers extracts um, more complex information than the layer below. And we had people develop learning algorithms um, for such networks a few decades ago. Um, but it wasn't really un until the past 10 or 15 years that the computing power and the amount of data we had uh, were enough to be able to demonstrate the amazing power of these learning algorithms. In reinforcement learning, the idea is how you learn from rewards. So 
you know, life is one big uh, set of rewards and punishments, and so it's very important for the nervous system to be able to decide what actions uh, to take to maximise the reward and minimise the punishment. And through, a, through many decades of experiments on um, animals, classical conditioning experiments, going all the way back to Pavlov's experiments um, with, his, um, with his dogs, it's been possible to ex uh, develop some very powerful mathematical principles for how any kind of learning system can learn from these kinds of rewards, including rewards which are delayed into the future. So it's one problem to uh, learn from a reward which is presented immediately, and another problem to learn from a reward which might not you might not achieve uh, for you know days or weeks or months or even even years. Yet we now understand um, both the mathematics of how that can happen, and a, an amazing result is that. Um, uh, about 20 years ago, people discovered that that mathematics is essentially implemented in the brain in the form of signaling of certain molecules like dopamine. So that actually, dopamine actually implements a reward signal in the brain in much the same way as a mathematics says a reward si signal should be implemented. I think when it comes to AI, there's two sides to it. There's obviously a negative side, and there's a positive side to it as well. If you look at the positives, it, it's amazing for humanity in the long run. We can see the advancements in medical fields and technology in terms of, there's a, there's a car outside that drives itself. That's incredible. And right there, just behind where you're sitting, there is a, a little tiny robot that solves Rubik's Cubes. We're just in the beginning of what's going to be a long journey in amazing advancements for humanity and I genuinely believe to always look at the glass half full when it comes to it and it's, it's going to be great. Going back to 2018, there was a league online game, Dota 2, which accepted into its ranks of players a new type of team. It's an artificial intelligence team called OpenAI5. OpenAI5 not only won the International World Championships, it's gone on in April of this year, 2019, to expand its uh, availability for gameplay. Any person who might want to play Dota 2 can challenge OpenAI5's bot team. We have all of the humans against five very special bots from OpenAI5. Now, why are they so successful? I think that's a good question to ask. You know, when we consider how fast a human can learn, we're bound by our ability to process information over time. AI changes the speed of learning. And when we consider reinforcement learning techniques, the Dota 2 AI bots have spent an accumulated 45,000 human years equivalent of training. And that's why they're so successful. Obviously, gameplay is a very interesting area of development for AI, but it's actually only one small area. And the applications of AI are far more diverse than that, in fact. Artificial intelligence now has the ability to utilize information in a way that wasn't previously possible. Data acquisition using, for example, the World Wide Web, or alternatively, when we think about smart cities, the amount of data that you can collect through utilities usage means that we have the possibility now to see real world applications where massive learning can take place over very brief periods of time to create a scenario where solutions are found to problems that humans have struggled with actually for quite a long time. My idea about artificial intelligence is it's a promising approach in the future. However, it requires a jump in the technology. At the moment, it has a problem of the accuracy and how reliable is the output of this artificial intelligence system. Is there any way to have 
some kind of feedback about the output, whether it's a correct decision or not. And I think the future of the artificial intelligence going that way to understand, to reasoning about artificial intelligence outcomes and the reason behind the decision from artificial intelligence. So how do we copy what's happening in the brain and put it in a neural network? Well, one of the easiest areas to start with is choosing a concrete, tangible process that we all do, and that's navigation. So all animals, all humans find their way around and we have maps in our brain that tell us where we are and where to go. And scientists have found all sorts of beautifully navigationally relevant neurons in the brain. And we can literally just copy what those neurons do directly into our software models in order to create, for example, robots or autonomous vehicles who can also find their way around. Artificial intelligence plays a key role in many other large technology arms races. Uh, one of the most visible is autonomous cars, self-driving cars or robot cars, depending on which term you prefer. Now, we've seen a lot of progress made over the last 10 years and there are dozens if not hundreds of major companies and startups uh, developing autonomous cars all around the world. Now we have cars already and have had for 10 or 20 years that can drive pretty well autonomously on the highway. The real trick has been solving that last 5 or 1% of driving conditions. So driving in complex urban environments when it's raining or snowing and knowing how to react when that person jumps out in front of the car looking at their mobile phone. And this is the area where a lot of the state-of-the-art AI development is actually happening. It's how machines, like autonomous cars, interact with us, humans, complex, unpredictable uh, and very vulnerable humans. Uh, and this is one of the areas where if the AI becomes good enough to work out what to do under all situations, at least as well as we human drivers do, uh, you will see autonomous cars everywhere. If they can't solve that, then expect it to be much more subdued. The challenge right now, of course, is that autonomous vehicles aren't as good as us in all situations. And for autonomous vehicles to really be widely commercially viable, they have to be deployed everywhere. A car that you drive yourself and then goes autonomous on the highway is cool and useful to some people, but it's not this multi-trillion dollar market that everyone is imagining. So in order for them to really roll out at a wide scale and potentially save lives, you really still have to solve these remaining problems of how to drive in complex city uh, situations with pedestrians and cyclists all over the place. Two years ago, the, the general consensus out there amongst people working in the, in the industry and in the, in the scientific research, uh, you know, they were very bullish on having these cars out and, and working in the real world within a couple of years. You know, the CEO of um, Waymo, which is the, the Google self-driving car initiative, which was, you know, one of the biggest, probably still the biggest, um, in the world. And they were, you know, incredibly bullish on this technology five years ago. Uh, the, the CEO has actually come out and said, it looks like we'll never actually have fully self-driving cars, ever, right? <laughs> there's always, what he said was, there's always going to be constraints. Now, what that really means in, in terms of, you know, what we've been discussing is, uh, and, you know, AGI, is that to, to do everything that a human driver does in, in driving a car, simply driving a car around the streets, you need to be as smart as a human to do that, you know? Uh, the interesting things are dealing with uh, perhaps groups of robots working together, uh, although uh, it's not as disruptive as some of the things in the past. You can't predict when fundamental changes in the science uh, will occur. And the next uh, big one may be around the corner, or it may, uh, it may not be. But substantial progress, particularly in the studies of human-robot interaction, have been going on as well, too, to get a better understanding of how it is that we relate to each other uh, with through robots and uh, how we can do better uh, with respect to that. Yeah. A social robot is a robot that can communicate and interact with people or other machines. It's completely different to traditional types of robotics where they've been designed not to have any interaction with people, for example in car manufacturing plants. Social robotics are specifically designed to have a communication or engagement with people. 
And artificial intelligence is playing a really big role in being able to empower the way that social robots can understand, behave and communicate with people in their daily life. I see humanoid robots being developed a lot more in future. The world is currently designed for humans. So if you're entering through a door, you're designed to push it using your hand and your amount of force as a human. If you're tidying up a particular workspace or you're walking around a city uh, exploring different sights and sounds. So the world is ultimately built for humans. So designing robots that have either a humanoid form or an understanding of how the human world works makes it easier for those robots to integrate into society, but also to create some value and benefit without having to restructure uh, buildings or tasks or the way that the world is designed to accommodate for that human. Yes, the question of can we develop a disembodied AI, an AI, AI in, a, in a box or a computer, or will we have to have uh, some sort of a, uh, will, the, will the AI have to have some sort of experience like we do, or uh, some sort of feedback from the world and some sort of way of modifying the world. The theories at the moment are that simply the AI needs a way of, you know, perceiving a world, whether it's real or simulated, perceiving itself in that world and being able to make a distinction, as we were talking before, about itself and everything else, and being able to manipulate objects um, and have basically a causal influence itself in the world. Um, laser scanner, so it's using the depth sensor to position itself on the map. It's really important to explore artificial intelligence in the sense of embodiment and having a look at robots as a way to create that wealth of knowledge because until you're out and moving around in the world like a robot would do, you're not seeing the world for what it really is. If you're training through different data sets or through information that's been provided to you, it's a very contained way of learning knowledge of how the world operates, how we engage with each other, and how do we go about achieving tasks on a day-to-day -day basis. But in terms of embodiment, if a robot is then going out and exploring the way that the world works, learning for itself through trial and error or through observing other people's behavior or through simply asking the nearest person, what should I do in this situation? I believe that's when we'll start to see a big burst of creating a robot that can understand human experience and then be able to uh, integrate into societies. The thing that I focus on is evolutionary learning and evolutionary learning is, is quite a bit different. What I do is based on, well, genetics. It's based on Darwinian evolution and it's based on competition. So for evolution to occur, you need three things. You need selection, you need variation and you need heredity. And this is true for natural creatures, it's true for computer programs, it's true for robots is really, really powerful, it's creative, it creates a novelty, diversity, all of these things that are really useful when you think about them in the context of, of learning. For myself, being in a group that does field robotics, where we're trying to take robots and use them to solve real problems outdoors in these nasty and structured Australian environments, um, you know, the, the, it's really about taking that analogy that that link to natural evolution you know natural evolution creates life that survives in a huge variety of really challenging environmental conditions and what we're trying to do is distill the things that allow that to work successfully and apply them to designing robots Uh, one thing that we do here is we deploy robots into, you know, for example, a, a rainforest to perform biodiversity studies. And we don't know the conditions in that rainforest, really. Um, you know, 
And it would be good to have robots that can, you know, not only adapt how they behave, um, but have the process that adapts their bodies as well. And when we start to do that, we're heading into um, the realms of this thing called embodied cognition. Embodied cognition is basically the opposite to Descartes, I think therefore I am. So we could consider maybe deep learning to be that I think therefore I am, where I am a system and I just learn things and then I've learned that thing. What embodied cognition is saying is to be intelligent in that sense, in the embodied sense, you need a body and you need a brain and you need to act in an environment. And if you've got all those things together, it's the interactions between the body and the brain the body and the environment that generates these really useful, rich behaviours that can help us solve really tricky problems. Um, and one way of doing that, you know, is evolution. So we can use evolution to design robot bodies. We can use evolution to learn the controllers that operate those bodies, if you will, that receive the sense of information, that push out commands to the wheels or to the legs to move it around. Um, and obviously they're all situated in this environment, so the environment plays a key role. If you imagine having a, a legged robot trying to walk through the jungle, it's going to need to behave very differently than walking across an ice rink. Okay, and that's where the environment really critically links into how we generate these behaviours. robots will eventually start to integrate more closely into society. They'll learn to operate in and around people and then it becomes a very seamless integration. It's no longer a human and then therefore a robot. It becomes a symbiotic relationship where you're providing information or objects to a robot to carry for you and the robot's providing perhaps a service or support back to you. We're going more, more and more towards natural interface which uh, make uh, the technology seamless and uh, allow us to be more and more actually human and uh, don't have to think or have so much uh, the need of uh, knowledge or uh, school uh, training to be able to uh, deal with the technology, understand the technology, and somebody that uh, is not uh, familiarized with the technology will, uh, is able to still uh, use it uh, really easily. Um, you don't need a large IQ either to use uh, technology. Nowadays it's already uh, seamless and very natural, and it leads us to what uh, is uh, more uh, human society back to the source really like where well, we was uh, more uh, living without technology and without have to do all the burden task and, and core of everyday life uh, as the technology taking care of it all the time saved by technology and then we can more focus on discussing between uh, people, exchanging information, developing ideas, exchange about uh, all uh, di different aspects that uh, are much more uh, human nature. The objective of uh, humanity uh, to develop all this technology is to help humanity uh, have to do less and less uh, by themselves uh, and uh, get rid of all those uh, repetitive tasks. Um, it's not to become a, a crazy scientist and develop uh, this uh, uh, machine and uh, say it's alive and uh, um, the, the motivation is not there for that. Uh, we are not necessarily looking uh, for replacements uh, of uh, companions. Um, and the only reason why we will do that and, and replace uh, um, people by machineries uh, is because we are lacking of people, uh, not because uh, we want to replace people uh, in a social uh, type of uh, roles. I think that in its current state, AI proves to be quite a useful tool for science and the advancements of fields like robotics and automation. I think that in the future, 
AI will be a very big part of our lives, but it's not going to have the same effect that the media tends to sensationalise. It's going to take over and become like some all-powerful intelligence. Yeah, it's going to help us in many other ways. The one thing I don't think we have seen quite yet, we may, is the ability to handle non-routine, uh, sometimes called wicked problems, where creativity and human, the co human capacity for ingenuity and discovery is absolutely crucial to being successful. Now one question of course is, are there enough jobs in the world to support a workforce of four or five billion people where creativity and ingenuity are the core of it? But at least right for right now, that is the path to success. One has to be able to handle a job, whether it's as an entrepreneur, as a sole proprietor, or even working for a big company. You have to be a unique person. You have to, to Tom Peters called it the brand you. You have to offer a value add that nobody else can do. So preparing to be unique, preparing not just to be one of the mass, because the mass is going away. The machines are taking over mass jobs. The Chinese took over mass jobs to start with, and now in the long run, it's automation and machines that will be doing most of the routine work in society. If you look at the history of work up until even almost the present, routine jobs were the bread and butter of the American middle class. Uh, salespeople, office people, factory people, construction people, they went to work and they did largely routine things most of the time. They didn't have to be creative, in fact they were discouraged from being creative. We're going to come a time when machines are taking all of those jobs and the only way to earn a decent living is to be creative. So the holy grail for many researchers is investigating the possibility of developing AGI or Artificial General Intelligence. There are a lot of definitions floating around for exactly what that means. The one that I like is that you create a machine or an agent that has the broad intellectual capability of a competent adult human. It can do everything that we can do, it can learn how to do everything that we learn how to do, and it can carry out all the tasks that we do on a daily basis without thinking. General artificial intelligence is the idea that you can create um, uh, learning algorithms which you can essentially learn in any, any situation. So we've been incredibly successful in the last few years at developing learning algorithms which can, for instance, learn to play Go. Um, and just recently it learned to play Quake, a version, of, um, a version of, of, of Quake. That paper was just published a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so these are very impressive learning um, procedures but they happen in very confined domains. So general artificial intelligence is the idea that um, just in any domain, you can ap apply this, um, this learning approach to rapidly figure out um, what's the appropriate thing to do in different situations. One of the tests that people derived or designed was the Turing test. Uh, and the idea of this test is very simple. Can a artificial intelligence agent talking to you through a computer screen or perhaps over a phone line, fool you into thinking it's a human. Now, the validity of the test in terms of being a true test of genuine artificial general intelligence is controversial. Uh, and it's a case of if you can fake it, does it really mean you're intelligent? And indeed, some of the initial approaches to going well on that task have been systems that have faked intelligence really, really well. And then you get down to some deeper philosophical questions, which is, if it can fake it so well it seems intelligent, is it actually intelligent? Or is it just sort of a shell pretending to be intelligent? And that is very much the realm of philosophers, I think. Uh, there was a case where someone got a computer to simulate a, a, a foreign boy of about 12 or 14 years of age or something. But they put these constraints on it, right? They made him foreign or made it foreign, so um, its its level of English didn't need to be that high. Um, and it was constrained to be a boy, so you wouldn't expect to have in-depth conversations about a lot of um, you know, difficult subjects like politics or science or whatever. Uh, and in, in that case, there were some people that couldn't detect that they were talking to a computer in that case. And that was claimed then to be passing the Turing test, but you know most people would say, no, it didn't. So we haven't passed the Turing test. When we consider the history of artificial intelligence and the sort of questions that we've asked about whether a machine is intelligent have changed considerably over the course of the last 60 or so years. 
fundamentally at the beginning, the questions were reasonably simple. We have come now to the conclusion that it's not enough just to mimic intelligence, but to actually attain a state of consciousness. And how we would be able to subjectively realize another person, let alone machine subjective consciousness, is philosophically a very difficult question to answer. When we consider the way that people approached, let's take for example, gameplay. Originally, the simple questions were, could the machine play a game of checkers? and win against a human component. And then we considered whether it could play chess and then of course go. The machines have been able of course to not only succeed at playing these games but to beat their human uh, uh, opponents quite successfully. The AI effect is this experience that we're finding as the technology advances and we're capable of answering so many more questions about what is possible it becomes mundane and we start to have a reductive analysis so that achievements are actually then relabeled as simply computation. And so the AI effect means that we say, that's not intelligence anymore. We actually change our minds and have decided that it has to be something more than that. It has to be something more than a simple computation. We've changed the goalposts over time. What we were asking questions about historically those questions may have been answered, but as they have been answered, we reduce them to this idea of it's just a computation. And we've expanded our ideas of what's possible, and we start to ask more of AI. One of the big barriers to achieving this goal is the idea of common sense. It's a very difficult way to teach a robot or a machine what exactly is common sense. So if you were to try and script a variety of different rules on how a robot should behave in a societal uh, setting, being able to say what is appropriate behaviour and what isn't appropriate behaviour could arguably be endless. There are a variety of different circumstances, factors, variables that would influence the way that a person would engage with the world and therefore trying to translate those societal norms and behaviours and approaches into a robot. And so if we can find a way to achieve this idea of common sense with robotics, it helps to break some of the biggest barriers we have, which is when robots need to be able to create behavior for the final 10% or 5% of scenarios where something completely unexpected happens and we need to know or have an idea of how the robot could provide some action or task or information during that setting. AI. Um, it's happening whether if we like it or not. That's that's the big thing. Um, the the question is, what are we going to do with it? And so, we're going to push it for the betterment of everybody, or for the betterment of a few. I'm really hoping for everybody, um, but I put as little AI as possible into these because they're dangerous, and I don't like dangerous AI. Of course, artificial intelligence is permeating more and more parts of our, our lives, and it's becoming something that we are starting to rely on more and more. So, for example, you know, I don't need to um, have an encyclopedic knowledge of the changes in traffic conditions as the day goes um, goes on, because I can just look at Google Maps and it will tell me um, where, you know, what, what are the best routes at any particular time of day. And so, I think. Th there will be an increasing trend of that. So us um, relying on AI to help advise us on, on decisions. But obviously that has to be very carefully managed so that the AI does not start making decisions which um, it thinks are sensible but we know are not sensible. And of course there's many examples uh, where that's happened in, in the past. Right now AI and robotics is almost completely a private sector activity, which is fine. The private sector is ingenious it's where the money is, it's where the money to be made is. But as they become larger and larger and larger, and, the, and what I just heard a new acronym is GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. <laughs> so the GAFA companies have now such enormous power that, um, that it, they can use that to make money for themselves, to help their customers, but it can also be abused. And so when do those become morph over into a public utility? When is Facebook considered to be a public utility like the telephone company 
or like a pipeline company, a common carrier. And so where the public has a chance to have it. So we can have this discussion on radio programs and on blogs and, 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 and video that we're doing here. But in the end of the day, these decisions are being made in boardrooms and in laboratories that, are, that, that we don't know what's going on. And so in that sense, I think we could have the discussion. But what is going to happen is largely outside of the civic realm. When we consider the future of artificial intelligence and neural networks, I think at this point in time it's important to realise that where we invest our money really counts. This is fundamentally an economic question. Government at the moment is enormously invested in this idea of innovation and you'll find that there's a lot of startups arising from university culture for example and engineering firms are changing and challenging what they've done previously because mechatronic engineering is becoming a more common and not only viable but sustainable and financially rewarding element of their businesses. Money is coming from different directions and governments are also funding, of course, military budgets. Both government and non-government military spending on um, artificial intelligence and mechatronic type research, in my understanding, has now exceeded $8 billion annually across the globe. This is an enormous investment in money. But from a community perspective, this is changing the way in which we see robotics moving forward. Artificial intelligence is one of these potentially transformative technologies uh, and like all new transformative technologies it acts as sort of a force multiplier. If we do the right thing with it we'll have great outcomes for society uh, but if we're not careful and we do some of the wrong things with it it could be an overall negative for society. One of the particular areas where people are concerned about artificial intelligence and, and related technologies of automation and robotics is future employment. Uh, and it's a valid concern because artificial intelligence is able to do some of the things that we in our jobs do every day and sometimes do it better than us. It's worth noting that right now AI cannot do all of almost anyone's job, it can only do part of it. And it's also worth looking at historical precedent. If we go all the way back to things like the Industrial Revolution, there were new transformative technologies, they were incredibly disruptive, uh, for a generation indeed, but over the long term it can be argued that they resulted in overall increase in the quality of life, but there was temporary disruption. And yes, robots do pose uh, a threat uh, to uh, employment. Uh, uh, and as it did in the days of, automation did in the days of the Industrial Revolution as well too. How severe is it is unclear. Will new jobs be created in their stead? Absolutely. Uh, the fundamental issue is can society provide a safety net as we move through this new industrial revolution or this robotics revolution that's occurring. If society can provide that, uh, then okay. Uh, if we just turn a blind eye to the changes that are going to occur, uh, then it is uh, quite worrisome. But uh, one could argue that no job is safe, even that of a professor. <laughs> In terms of work, let's start there, which everybody wants to talk about. If the robots become the workers, what do we do? Uh, and that's happened already. I mean, that started in the 1970s and the 1980s with very simple machines. If you used to go to a restaurant, people had to take orders, they had to cook and all of this stuff. You go to McDonald's and there's somebody with, might even not have a high school education, and they're punching buttons and the machine is doing all the rest. So it's the de-skilling of society. Now that has been, okay, so if you, if you don't get an education, then you got to work at McDonald's. Now if you have machines who know how to design cars, who know how to build bridges, who know how to do accounting and finance, well, that's the de-skilling of the professional class. And then what, then what do we all do? So how do we prepare for this? We have to uh, ask companies with this kind of enormous societal influence to be more transparent about what they do, what their plans are, what their algorithms are, and how they're, how they're approaching these kinds of things. As we are with the military, as we are with police, which also have tremendous power at their disposal, but for the most part, they try and they're supposed to be transparent. Now we have 
private businesses that do not have to be transparent. Oh, it's all proprietary, and there's nothing that we can, you know, we can do about it. Uh, that is, that's a dangerous situation. So we can have all the discussion we want. But if it's in the hands of people who don't have to say what they're doing and can do basically whatever until something bad happens and oh then Facebook you know gets a red face and and then they have to you know change they tweak this and tweak that and away they go. But uh, for the most part, it's uh, it, it's in their hands. Society is always concerned about how things will play out. One of the barriers with AI technology is that a lot of it is very complex, very sophisticated, and much of it's locked behind proprietary company doors. So making sure that everyone in society, not just the technologists developing it, have a sufficient understanding of what it can actually do, what it will be able to do in the near future, and what is hype and what is reality is critically important because we want everyone to be able to voice an informed opinion on how AI should roll out and to be, be deployed in society. I see robotics as another support tool that will help what we're currently trying to achieve, which is to advance civilization in different ways. I see robots being another technology that will help the way that we want to achieve our goals to help enhance efficiency and productivity. I don't think this is an argument between robots versus humans. I think it's really important to look at what exactly robots are doing to help support human life what they're doing to help enhance productivity and efficiency, whether it's helping to harvest more food, whether it's helping to move goods in a way that helps support people by getting those goods sooner, or being able to provide support in education or healthcare scenarios. So I really see this as a civilization that can work well together if robots are created in a way that's effective, acceptable, but also making sure that they're deployed in a way that provides uh, empowerment to people as well. So there's a lot of focus on when artificial general intelligence will ever happen. Uh, I don't know. I know that it feels like we aren't anywhere close now as opposed to other sort of more mundane goals where it might be five or ten years. Uh, all I can say is that there is definitely a lot of uncertainty. We've seen with things like the AI beating the Go player that our ability to predict when these events would happen is very much uncertain. And so we should treat general intelligence with the same, I guess, respect in terms of unpredictability. I've always been saying somewhere between 50 and 200 years looks like a, a reasonable uh, timeline for that to happen. So and that, that's for artificial general intelligence, which I guess you would say is intelligence that was comparable to, hu to human intelligence. The other idea is the singularity, right, that you might hear something about. That idea is when um, machine intelligence exceeds human intelligence. So it's important to understand that AI has already surpassed human intelligence in many domains. So, for instance, a computer first beat the best chess player in the world in uh, 1997, uh, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov. And so what happens is that um, as soon as, so there's this idea of these challenges that if a computer could do that, it would be really intelligent. But as soon as that happens, then people sort of, re re sort of reclassify what it means to be really intelligent. So the humans always come out on top. So we had chess and then more recently we've had Go. And so I see it not so much as um, conversion towards a singularity, as more just a succession of advances in particular domains. Um, and we will, we'll learn, we will learn to live with those ad advances and often um, we can embrace those advance, advances and use them to enrich our lives. So for instance, the world of you know, chess has um, not collapsed because uh, computers are now much better at chess than, than humans. Rather, humans now um, help use the computers to help them study their, their own games and it enriches humans' understanding of the game, the kind of insights that um, these uh, computers can now, now bring. You really need to think about this time frame, 50 to 200 years. We will have machines that are as smart as people. You know, what will that really mean for society? That's, um, that's an amazing question. Do, will people just not need to work? You know, will it be, uh, everything can be done by machines. You can work if you want to, um, but you won't have to. But if you're not working, what are you doing? Um, just playing games? I mean, you might get bored with that. If the possibility of uploading minds and a lot of this stuff sounds like science fiction, but the fact is, if we, if we have artificial general intelligence and we have super intelligence and we've passed that singularity, 
uploading a mind is probably going to be possible. And, you know, as bizarre as it sounds and as bizarre as it seems, most people say that will happen within 200 years. And these are not crazy people, these are the experts in the field. So given how far we've come in the last 200 years from the pre-industrial age to now, to having, you know, smartphones and, and talking about AI as a, as a, as a real possibility, um, the next 200 years, given the, the pace of change, anything could happen. You know, this is a different way of looking at technology. Historically, machines have been inanimate objects. They haven't had this idea of self-awareness, of moral reasoning, the ability for language or interaction. So what we're looking at is a different way of utilising technology and technology interacting with us. That doesn't mean that we have to lose control. What it means is that we have a creative impetus, a capacity to express not only our interest and I think fascination with what it means to be conscious, but a very real way that this can explain it back to us. It's a collective endeavor. It's not one about handing our authority over to some sort of hypothetical machine overlord. Arnold Schwarzenegger, yeah, he played the Terminator. And I think we all enjoyed those movies, well, I personally did. But at the end of the day, that's not the future that we're working towards right now. It's far more about collective integration and understanding of what in fact it is to be human. What we'll definitely see over the next five or 10 years is continuing steady progress in some areas of AI and its rollout, often invisible to you and I, into sort of the things that we do every day from buying a coffee in the morning, getting in a car, to booking a restaurant to go to that night. We'll see AI playing an increasing role in our everyday lives. In terms of significant advances, so AI that's smart enough to drive autonomous vehicles all around us, AI that can act as a personal assistant that can help us in our everyday lives, that's still a little more uncertain. That may happen soon. It may take us much longer to create the technology uh, to perform well enough to be useful. In terms of the long term, the general intelligence, well, we really don't know. But there will probably be some flags raised along the way in terms of milestones uh, that will preface getting to that artificial general intelligence. And we've still got a long way um, to go. So if you look at self-driving cars, for instance, um, they've been just around the corner for quite a long time now. And these are just very, very difficult computational problems. And so I think we've still got a bit of time. There's a lot of hype in the media about, about, these, um, about these technologies, but um, I think there is still a way to, a way to go. Yeah, my stand, I think it's a, a really positive uh, view for the future because we reach a point where technology uh, can help to um, erase all the different problems, environmental, uh, protection of the existing uh, fauna and flora, uh, being able to be uh, more uh, responsible as uh, we get uh, more power. Also, it's have a big uh, energy footprint, uh, we uh, become smarter about understanding where the energy can be harvested, how it can be concentrated and how it can be recycled. Um, and uh, nowadays, uh, using AI and robotics, it's a, a, a better way and a more optimized way uh, to provide a better life for, for everyone. I'm really positive about the future. It will require a lot of involvement from different technology companies as well as regulators and people involved in making policy and economics, uh, roboticists themselves, ethicists, psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists. It's really going to be a huge collective ordeal when we're looking at placing robots in different kinds of systems and environments and societies. So I think this is a conversation we all need to be having right now. How exactly can we do this to make sure that everyone receives the most amount of benefit from using robotic systems and that they support and help people in a way that benefits everyone as a civilization? My goal, which is unlikely to happen during my lifetime, um, is to consider robots as a species a species that are selected using a Darwinian mechanism that can um, create themselves in a way using 3D printing. So not in the, the sense of, you know, 
the Terminator or selfie producing machines or anything like that. We very carefully don't do that. But what I'm saying is we could have um, a small factory that has all the components to build a load of robots. And we could deploy it out, you know, on an asteroid in deep sea, in deep space, uh, anywhere where we can't get humans easily or we don't want to put humans in. Right? And this factory can learn um, using the ability to create robots about the best types of robots um, to use in a certain situation. If we create super intelligent AI that is then able to then uh, design its successor, you know, even, even design even more capable AI or even smarter AI, um, will they necessarily have the same um, safeguards that we've built in into the original AI? Well, you know, I guess if we've done our job correctly, then that super intelligent AI that we've created will then have the desire, just as we did, to build in the same safeguards into anything that it designs. You know, I guess you could ask, well, how many iterations can that actually go on for before it goes, well, actually, maybe this isn't such a good idea. That's, that's really speculative, you know, and, and really can't answer that. So we're talking about the existential threat of AI and how much of a threat actually is AI to us or could it be in the future. And yes, there are some people who are, who are you know, quite concerned about this, about, uh, you know, a super intelligent AI running amok and for whatever reason, you know, wiping out the human race. Most people who actually work in the field are not so concerned about that. You know, I think the, the general feeling is that um, by the time we can actually construct an AI such as that, which, which you know, is obviously some way off, um, we're nowhere near that at the moment, we'll also understand ways to, to control it or contain it, or at least to, to render it harmless, you know, whether it's controlled or contained or not, um, to make it benign. The more real concern of people um, in the field doing the research in this um, is, is not the, the malicious AI, but it's basically, um, well, it's our incompetence, basically. So the, the unintended side effects of a, a super intelligent AI that's not going to, you know, just decide to wipe us out because it deserves to live and we don't, you know. That's not really the concern. But there is this um, potential concern where we'll just make an AI that we'll lose control of It'll be doing something that we want it to do, but it'll, it'll be doing it in a way that we don't want it to do it. When we look at the future of AI and the singularity that people think might be a likely next step in the way this technology is moving forward, well, there's a lot of ideas about what could reasonably happen. Unfortunately, most of those hypotheticals just won't be. A lot of these ideas actually could be very problematic for us, for our future and for our safety. And whilst I do think it's worth considering them, essentially it's just science fiction. And at this point in our lives, I think it's far more worthwhile considering science fact. Where are we right now? What are we investing in? And what do we expect to get from this technology? If and when a singularity arises, it will be a single linear trajectory. It won't be a hypothetical. And so when we spend time considering all of these ideas about what's possible, we can lose sight of what's really happening now, which is an incredibly exciting moment in our collective history. Hello, Adam. I have completed a full analysis of your vital signs and have verification from your doctor. There is a 75% chance that you are having a mild heart attack. Please do not be alarmed. An autonomous vehicle has been dispatched and should intercept your position in approximately 10 minutes. Please walk slowly in your current direction. There is an open landing pad in 300 meters. Please wait there. I will continue to monitor you. Please stay on the line. 